Viridian, The Green Guide, by Clouds, My Head in the Clouds Not Coming Down, read by Oak Shadow 5, Chapter 89, Aggression, Summary, The USJ. Shota was just finishing up his reports for the night and was looking forward to a few well-deserved hours of sleep when Bakugo slammed open the door to the police station. He didn't even say hello to Sansa at the desk before stopping back to Tsukauchi station. Shota heaved a heavy sigh and pushed the last of his paper work away. Katsuki Bakugo, it is literally the middle of the night. Is there any reason this couldn't wait until school tomorrow? And what happened to your face? And if a business hobo, Bakugo scoffed. And maybe because by the time school starts, it might be too late. I don't know. It's pretty late right now, Amplifier teased. What are you doing out on a school night? Got a lead, Bakugo grumbled. I... fine. Long story short, Ogawa woke up, I went out to look into something he told me, and I got stopped by a villain who warned me not to go to school tomorrow. Do you idiots see why maybe I wouldn't want to just sit on that info? Tsukachi stared at him. He said, what? She, actually, introduced herself as Himiko Choga. Bakugo rolled his eyes. She's a creepy psychopath, but where the info came from isn't as important as what we're going to do about it. From what Toga said, it's an organization and they've recruited a lot of people. Toga, Shota groaned. Problem child, what is it with you and attracting serial killers? Maybe it's just my winning personality, Bakugo rolled his eyes. Now, she wouldn't tell me exactly when or where, but I'm thinking the target's at least in the same neighborhood as the UA, if not the school itself. And she said tomorrow, so... So that at least gets us a window, which is better than nothing, Tsukachi said. Any idea why she volunteered the info? It came up. Bakugo shrugged. She sought me out and kept going on and on about how Stain thinks very highly of me and all that crap. Then when she realized I didn't know about the attack, he mumbled something that Shota couldn't quite make out. What was that? Ugh! She said something about how I was too cute to die without her watching or some shit. Bakugo scowled, a slight blush on his face. I don't remember exactly what she said, but it was creepy, all right. Aww! And Bluffer held her hands over her heart. Oh, what a hero gets shy when girls flirt with him? Amplifier, do I need to remind you that Toga is known for killing most of her crushes? Tsukachi rubbed at the bridge of his nose. But that checks out, actually. Warning you about an attack she wouldn't be a part of is exactly something she would do, which unfortunately means that this info is probably trustworthy. Wonderful. I already told you that! Bakugo crossed his arms. Now, what are we gonna do? Cancel school or something? Only as a last resort, Shota said. I'll talk to Nezu, but the PR nightmare canceling classes in Slate would cause means that we'll need to look at our options first. We'll start by talking to the commission and getting more heroes stationed in the area for the day, Tsukachi said. UA has the highest security around, so once other students are inside the gates, they should be safe. The biggest issue will be before and after school, and maybe during lunches? It's easier to make students stay on campus for lunch than it is to cancel class, Shooter said, grabbing his phone to call Nezu. Go get some sleep, Kachan. The rest of us aren't going to be able to. Amplifier stopped him before he could get too far. Oh, and he said Ogawa woke up already? That's amazing! Yeah, Bakugo huffed. At least he told me who it was that he wanted to save. Some guy named Kumo. He used to have a cloud quirk or something like that, but Ogawa said those monsters put them both through the same thing. So that's probably not the case anymore. Whatever. See you tomorrow, losers. Shuta froze. It... He was dead. Had been for ten years now. There was no way he was alive. And even if that was possible, Offer One wouldn't have any logical reason to hold onto him for this long. It had to be a coincidence. That was the only possibility that made sense. But what if it wasn't? By the time he managed to shake himself out of his stupor, Bakugo was already out the door, and Tsukachi was looking at him with concern. Eraser head? Uh, you're right. I'm fine. Shuta took a deep breath. He could worry about Shirokumu later, after he made sure that none of his students followed his example and died before they could graduate. Come on, we've got breaths to protect. Katsuki was starting to relax, if only slightly. The trip to school had been extraordinarily uneventful, 
Even if there were more heroes signing autographs than usual, and Tsukachi was right about U.S. security being practically impregnable, the increased hero presence outside would be able to stop any attack on the gates before it really began. And even if there was an attack, it would be at the main school, not at some building tucked away in the far corner of campus. That was probably why All Might wasn't coming on the field trip. They needed their most powerful hero close, and at the ready for if and when the attack happened, even if the official reason for his absence as special heroic obligations. Katsuki stared at the window and half listened to his classmates' conversations as they made their way to wherever their rescue exercise was. Hey, Kaminari, I've been meaning to ask. Jiwa leaned over the seat to talk to Dan's face. When we were preparing for the exercise, you said you didn't have any long-range attacks, but I'd say magnetism is pretty long-range, don't you think? Uh, that's kind of a new application of my quirk, Kaminari started out. I knew about it, obviously. I, uh, just didn't mention it because I hadn't had time to practice, you know. I didn't think I'd be able to rely on it, but then adrenaline kicked in, so... Katsuki rolled his eyes. Izuku had probably come up with the idea during one of his ramblings, and they just hadn't gotten around to trying it yet. When they'd been kids, Izuku had had a million ideas of how to use explosion better, but most of the time Katsuki's problem wasn't that he was too busy, it was that he was too stubborn. He should probably ask the nod for some tips now that he was learning not to be an idiot. The training facility was excessively large, but then again, that seemed to be a trend at UA. Thirteen was already waiting outside, and Katsuki couldn't help a small grin at the way Uraraka fangled over one of her favorite heroes. He had the thought that Izuku would probably have done the exact same thing, but with how often Viridian worked with heroes, he might not freak out the same way he would have when they were little kids. It was just one more thing that Katsuki just honestly didn't know about him anymore. After Thirteen let them all inside, they lectured them on the harmful potential of their quirks, a subject that Katsuki was all too familiar with. He didn't tune them out, but he did take the time to look over the facility, just so he knew what he was walking into. There were multiple disaster zones, probably under the teacher's control, and each of them housed a different type of disaster that they would face in the field. It was good that they were focusing on rescue and not just combat. It would help them all be better, more rounded heroes. But with how much UA had obviously spent on this building, he hadn't been expecting any electrical glitches. The lights flickered slightly before going out, and he glanced toward Kaminari, but he seemed just as confused as everyone else. Hey, it wasn't me this time, I swear. It's probably residual issues from the last blackout, Raraka suggested. My parents were construction, and they've had problems like that before, when fuses have blown out and stuff. I don't think... Thirteen said hesitantly. Katsuki's eye caught on something odd near the fountain, and he vaguely heard the others speculating that it was all part of the exercise, but with Toga's warning, he wasn't about to count on that. These were the villains he'd been warned about. Somehow, they'd gotten inside without having to pass through the gate, and chosen to attack a small class, rather than the main school. Katsuki was about to shift into a fighting stance when the small spot of purple mist expanded, and he realized who was coming through. Stand back, Iraza said. Those are... You've got to be fucking kidding me! Katsuki screamed. He stalked forward, causing a good third of the villains to instinctively take a step back as they recognized him. Seriously? What the fuck do you goddamn idiots think you're doing? If you're gonna do illegal shit, at least be fucking smart about it. Attack a UA? The hotbed for both heroes and hero students? Seriously? One of the villains, some creepy-ass skinny dude with hands all over him, who apparently thought he was the leader, gaped at him. What? What are you... Kuragiri, what is this NPC doing? Shut up, extra! Katsuki barked and made a beeline towards two of the villains in particular. And you two, Maki, Akiko? I thought you were better than this. You guys were doing so fucking well, too. When are you guys gonna leave all this shit behind for good? Well, um... Akiko stammered and looked at the ground, her pigtails going limp. You see, it's kinda complicated and one thing led to another and... Tell you didn't go crawling back to that bitch as boyfriend of yours. Katsuki pointed at her accusingly. You promised that you were dumping his ass for good this time. Kajan. Maki started. Katsuki whipped around to face him. And you, huh? What's your excuse? I thought you were trying to make a nice life for the girlfriend of yours. It was odd seeing someone as large as Maki trying to make himself small. Even though he was wearing a full face mask, Katsuki could assume he looked just as embarrassed and discombobulated as Akiko did. 
Um, well, I mean, with an ugly quirk, it was more difficult than I thought to make ends meet, and... You think I don't fucking know that? Katsuki said. You think I haven't talked to enough of these extras to know how much discrimination can screw people over? Not to mention that I've been on the other side of this, remember? I have perpetuated those stereotypes, for God's sake. But if you're gonna return to a life of crime or whatever, at least pick one that's not gonna get you arrested. Denki watched open-mouthed as Bakugou stopped an entire horde of actual real-life villains by giving them a tongue lashing. It was freaky enough that he had the courage to just straight up yell at a group of villains that were probably there to attack them, but what was really insane was that the villains were actually listening to him. A good third of them were looking at the floor like scholar children, and some of the others were whispering frantically to each other. They... they know him, Jira said numbly. The ones who don't recognize him are asking whether it's the head cousin or not. Apparently it is. Denki turned back to watch as Bakugo kept playing on the villains. Why would you ever think that was a good idea? The villains he was talking to muttered something in response that made Baku go around his eyes. Yeah, and let me guess, a good chunk of that excellent pay was gonna come after the job. You can't tell me you actually fell for that crap? Baku go gestured to the man with creepy hands all over his body, who seemed to be the head villain. Take one look at that guy and tell me that he's not bitch as broke and living in his parents' basement. He isn't intending to pay you because you're all gonna get caught. Is... is he roasting the villains? Uraka asked. Aizawa heaved a tired sounding sigh. Let's use that distraction for what it is. Everyone get out the doors and start making your way back to the UA. I'll stay with Kachin and make sure he doesn't do anything even more stupid. But... Ida started to argue, but Denki cut him off as Aizawa ran down the stairs to assist Bakugo. He was the class president, and he really didn't know what exactly he was supposed to do in this situation. But he did know that he was supposed to keep his classmates safe. If we stick around, we're just more times to distract 13 and Aizawa. Also, the alarms aren't going off, so we need to find a way to contact the school and let them know we're being attacked. Ida, you run ahead. He started urging everyone forward. The power was out and the doors were electric, so he could probably power them himself, and if that didn't work, then hopefully his magnetism would be strong enough to tear them off the hinges. He had to get everyone out and keep them safe. This really wasn't what he'd had in mind when Ezra had mentioned a rescue exercise. Kachan didn't have a plan. He was just disappointed and angry, but it was working. Maki and Akiko, as well as a good number of the other villains, seemed to be realizing how idiotic attacking UA was and were looking at the ground, embarrassed by their own stupidity while others were nodding along with Katsuki's rant and finally starting to see he had a point. The weird purple mist they'd come through was still covering the plaza, which gave him an idea. You know what? Just get out of here, Katsuki offered in frustration. Maybe you'll get lucky and the heroes just chalk this whole thing up to momentary insanity. It was a few long moments before a few started turning around and heading back into the portal that had brought them. He turned to Maki and Akiko, who wilted under his glare. Sorry, Kachan. Makiko grumbled as he turned around. We didn't think it'd be your class, but still. Yeah, sorry, Akiko added. Uh, see you later, yeah? Katsuki gave a sharp nod. You better count on it. She winced, but turned around and followed Maki and the smart ones away. Katsuki stared after them, trying not to show any shock on his face as he realized just how many villains had taken him up on his offer. He hadn't been expecting that to actually work, not that he wasn't relieved it had. Cheetah! A yell from beside him was the only one he got before the creepy hand guy launched himself at him. Kiragiri, keep our party from leaving! If their hearts are not in it, they are more likely to betray us to the heroes than to fight for our cause, the mist said. Our remaining forces are strong enough that the weaklings are gone, young Shigaraki. Kaski rarely watched as Shigaraki scratched his neck. He'd been lucky to dodge that first attack, especially since he had no idea what his quirk was, or what those hands had to do with it, and he wasn't looking forward to what would happen if Shigaraki decided he was a cheater after all. So far... It looked like this Kurogiri mist guy was the dad friend and Shigaraki was the leash kid. But he'd been a leash kid. He knew how easy it was to blow through those limits without looking back, so he needed to be ready to fight. Blood crashed suddenly the entrance and Shigaraki swore. Kurogiri, you useless. If you want our exit gate, I'd dust you right now. Stop this brat from escaping. I'll wreck the griefer. No moo! We got 
the beginning of the USJ attack. Oh my gosh, yes. And also the whole paragraph of Katsuki like berating and ranting at the villains, at the villains in quotation marks. That was so fun to record because I could just scream. <laughs> but anyways, guys, I hope you all enjoyed chapter 89 of Red in the Green Guide. And I'll see you all next time. Bye!